Oh, there you go. Okay. I turned it off to cough. So, um, I want to talk about faithfulness, being faithful. You know, faithfulness, carrying out what you're supposed to do, what you've said you would do, what you've agreed to do. And it's something that we, we promise, right? I mean, marriage, right? <laughs> Promising to be faithful to your husband, to your wife, or, or, or promising in a way you, you've promised to serve, to be faithful. Just last week, we welcomed our, our new uh, members of the board of directors, and they promised to be faithful. Uh, or, or an oath of office, a government official, or law enforcement, or military promising to be, to be faithful. But, you know, it's not always a, a formal thing, you know, it's just informal, being faithful to a friend, being faithful to your, your values, to your, your principles, to your, your purpose. So, uh, being faithful is, is relatively easy when everything is going well, right? But it's hard when it's difficult, when it's, when it's costly, when it involves loss. Like being faithful to a friend who's let you down or, or being faithful to a, a task or a mission even when it's dangerous. That's when faithfulness is, is really tested, right? I got to see a pretty extreme, I think, example of faithfulness recently. As many of you know, Teresa and I were away on vacation most of July, and we had the chance to be in France for a few weeks. And while we were there, we visited the Normandy beaches, where the D-Day invasion attacks occur, the decisive turning point of World War II. And we'd actually prepared for this. We knew we were going to visit there, and so we read lots of books and watched lots of stuff, to, so we'd better appreciate what we were seeing and the extreme faithfulness displayed. And one that really just made an I don't know, impact on me while I was there was a place called Pont du Hoc. Maybe some of you are familiar with the day, familiar, know what it is. It's a place where it's up on a, up on a cliff, up on a high, high point, and they had to take out these German guns because the guns were pointed both at Omaha Beach and Utah Beach. And so these army rangers landed on the beach and scaled the cliff under fire and, and achieved, not all of them made it, made it to the top, fearsome battle, and then found out that the guns had been moved, and then they found them and disabled them. Just extreme faithfulness at extreme cost. They had a mission, they carried it out, and we saw that at Omaha, and we saw that at Utah, and then we visited, we visited the cemetery at, at, uh, at Omaha Beach. I think some of you probably have been there, and it makes quite, quite a moving impact to walk among the graves and seeing the cost of extreme faithfulness to a mission. Okay, that's extreme. But we're all called to faithfulness in one way or another in multiple ways in our lives. Are you faithful? Are you being faithful? Faithful to your husband, to your wife. Faithful as a son, as a daughter, as a parent, as a grandparent. Faithful as a worker. Faithful as a church member. Faithful as a follower of Christ. Faithful. Well, faithfulness is our focus today the text that we heard Sharon just read from, from Hebrews 3, 1 to 6 focuses on faithfulness and, and being faithful. Fo focuses on a faithfulness of, of Moses and the faithfulness of Jesus and all for the purpose of encouraging 
our faithfulness. Now, before I, I dig into it, you know, we, we, are, we are, this is part of our, our series on the letter to the Hebrews, our big major series throughout the summer into the fall, um, and, and we've been away from it for the past couple of weeks. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Justin, uh, Justin Wood, a uh, seminarian, preached his first sermon here. That was wonderful to see. And last week, uh, Kevin giving us an overview of the theme of the youth gathering. But today we're getting back into Hebrews. So just real briefly, just briefly a recap. The whole point of this letter to the Hebrews is faithfulness, really. It is being faithful to the Lord Jesus in the face of difficulty and opposition. In the case of the letter writer's recipients, it was persecution and opposition. But as we've talked about, there's all kinds of things that can lead us and and distract us and grab our attention away from faithfulness to Christ. Things in the culture, things in our own personal lives, And the point of this book is Jesus is better. He's better. Whatever would grab our attention away, whatever it is, for for the the people that the letter came to, it was the, the Old Testament faith. They were being tempted to go back to the Old Testament faith. For us, it's other things. But the point is this. Jesus is better so, so be faithful. And we've heard over the past few weeks how Jesus is better than the angels. The writer pointed that out. Better than the angels, but as it's talked about earlier this month, he's better than the angels. He's higher than the angels, higher than all, but he lowered himself. He lowered himself, became less than the angels, became like us in every way, even tempted like us. Why? So he could be faithful as our Savior and die for us. And this is ultimately why Jesus is better, because he's Savior. Okay, now we're going to get into chapter 3, and we're leaving angels behind uh, for a while. We'll come back later. Uh, And our attention now is going to be on Moses and the Exodus. Now, why, why, why Moses? Well, like I said, the, the people that the letter came to were being tempted, distracted to go back to the Israelite faith, to leave Jesus and go back to the temple, back to that. And the center of that faith is Moses. I mean, Moses was, was the big character. Moses was the one through whom the law was given, through whom all the, the sacrifices and the worship life was given, through whom the tabernacle was built. It was Moses. And so we're focusing on Moses, and the point here is we're going to see Jesus, just as Jesus is better than the angels, as we saw in chapter 1 and 2. Now we're going to hear Jesus is better than Moses. Okay, what's that about? What's, what's it mean? We're going to walk through the text. We're going to walk right back through it. So let's pull up verse 1. Verse 1, and oh, it turned off. Interesting. Okay, um, verse 1 of, of chapter 3 says this, Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling... Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Okay, I'll go back to the beginning of that verse. The, uh, notice how, this is really important, notice how the letter writer identifies his readers, who identifies us. We are the readers. He says, you are holy, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling. Really important point to point out about faithfulness. It's not faithfulness, the call to faithfulness. It's not a matter of be faithful and then you'll be worthy of heaven. Be faithful and then you'll be worthy of forgiveness and grace. No, 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 no. Notice what he's saying. You are holy. You you have the heavenly calling. It's grace. It's gift. It's pure gift. We're called to faithfulness because we have received the heavenly calling, because we are declared holy. It's so important. We start with the gospel. We start with grace. So so we've got to keep keep that in mind when we talk about faithfulness. Okay, so he says, fix our thoughts on 
Jesus. Fix our thought. Why should we fix our thoughts on Jesus? Why is he, why is he better? Well, let's go on to verse 2. And here we're going to get into Jesus and Moses, but first he's going to point out that Jesus and Moses have something in common. Verse 2, he, Jesus, was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all God's house. Jesus was faithful to the Father. Moses was faithful as he served in God's house. Now, we're going to We're going to define that a little more further in a little bit. For now, just, just focus on this, what you mean by house. Jesus was faithful. Moses was faithful. Okay? They're, they have this in common, faithful. But there's a difference. Now we're going to go on to verse 3 and verse 4. It says this, Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses. Jesus is greater than Moses. Just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. For every house was built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Okay, go back to, back to verse, verse 3, I think. So Moses was a faithful servant in God's house. He was faithful to what he was to do in God's house. Now, what do you mean by God's house? Not the tabernacle, not the temple. It's a metaphor. What he means by God's house is God's people the Israelites, the people of God. Moses was one of them serving among them, and he was faithful to his calling among the people. Okay, so Moses is faithful in God's house. Jesus is faithful over God's house. That's why he's greater. And then it points out in verse 4 that every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Notice here the, 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 the pointing out that Jesus is truly God. Okay, he says that Jesus is the builder. God is the builder. Okay, so Moses, Jesus greater than Moses because he's the builder. He's ruling over the house. Okay. Now, verse 5. Let's take a closer look at Moses' faithfulness. This is where it gets, it gets really important into Jesus here. Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, <clears throat> Moses was faithful as a servant in all God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. Okay, you see uh, the little quote marks up there. He's actually quoting Numbers 12, 7. But this is where we see Moses' faithfulness. Moses was faithful in many, many ways in his ministry, but the writer is pointing out this. He was faithful in bearing witness teaching, speaking, preaching, writing down the Word of God. But notice how he words it, to what would be spoken by God in the future. Moses was faithful, speaking what would be spoken by God in the future. See, everything Moses did pointed ahead to Jesus. That's what Jesus was referring to in our gospel today when he was talking about Moses and said, Moses pointed ahead to me. You should look at the scriptures thinking you have eternal life. They point to me. Moses pointed to me. This is what the writer's talking about. Everything Moses did, all of his writing, all of his actions, ultimately pointed to the builder of the house, to Jesus. The whole sacrificial system, all the sacrifices pointed to the cross. That's going to be a big theme later in this verse. The tabernacle itself pointed ahead to Jesus. That's going to be a big theme coming up later in the verse. The, the promised land itself and the Sabbath promised land pointed ahead to the resurrection and the new creation. Everything pointed to Jesus. So Moses was faithful. He was faithful in pointing ahead to Jesus. He's among the people of God pointing ahead to him. Okay, verse 6. But Christ is faithful as the Son over God's house. And we are his house, if indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we glory. So he controls, 
with a call to faithfulness. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. But first, let's go back to the beginning of verse 6. He is faithful as a son over God's house. So now we're going to focus on Jesus' faithfulness. Moses was faithful and pointing ahead. Now, how is Jesus faithful? How is Jesus faithful as a son of God over the house in which he built? Let's talk about houses and building and faithfulness. I want to talk about another part of our, our vacation. Um, while we were there, we had a chance to see quite a few houses, big houses, uh, palaces, chateaus, uh, like Chambord, built by Francis I, ginormous, or other ones like that as well. But, but the one that kind of takes the case um, over the top, opulent, gigantic, and just beyond comprehension is Versailles. I don't know if any of you have been, been there. Just over the top, grander, grandeur in size and beauty. What a house. It was built by Louis XIV, essentially as a temple to himself. He was an absolute monarch, ruled over France for 70 years, longer than any other, any other monarch. His famous saying, you might have heard, you know, l'état c'est moi, I am the state. So he was an absolute monarch, and so he built this magnificent palace to himself, to his glory. And it is really over the top. Um, he's definitely a lord, lording over the house. But while I was there, I had an interesting incident, little incident, that made me smile. Actually made me chuckle a little bit. We were finishing up our tour, and, um, and of course, anytime you go to a, any kind of museum or place like that, you cannot leave without going through the gift shop. You know, you're funneled to the gift shop. So we're out in the gift shop. We step into the gift shop, and there's music playing through the speakers. And of course, making it appropriate, they're playing some classical music. And what they were playing in particular recognized that right away they were playing on the speakers Handel's Messiah, the Hallelujah Chorus. And in particular, I walk into the gift shop, and the thing, the part of it that is, is playing right then is the line towards the end of it. And he shall reign forever and ever. And it made me smile. It made me laugh. I mean, Louis, you built this great house. You reigned for 70 years. You're an absolute monarch. But you're dead. <laughs> you're dead. And everything you worked for is gone. And it was like this sudden reminder. Hey, Jesus. Jesus is Lord. He shall reign forever and ever. He is the absolute monarch. He rules over the house. Now, there's another difference, though. Another difference. The, um, you see, when I don't want to go too far down the rabbit hole of history here, but I've got to point something else out. You know, when, when Louis built Versailles, he, he pretty much wrecked France's economy. He drained the treasury to build this palace to himself. And it really messed up the, the, the country's economy. And some historians say that it started France on a path that inevitably led to the revolution. So he, he, he drained the treasury at a time when most of the people in the country were already impoverished. They were in poverty. And yet he built this palace to himself. Okay. How did Jesus build his house? Not by impoverishing the people, but impoverishing himself. He laid down his life. He became poverty, if you will. 
He died for our sins, our forgiveness, our justification. He rose for our forgiveness. He was faithful. The faithfulness of Jesus to build this His house. The faithfulness of Jesus to redeem us. The faithfulness. And, and we then, if you look at it this way, we are His Versailles. We are His house. He has built us. He rules over us. And we are, in His eyes, more magnificent and splendid, splendid than that palace in France. And I just really want you to encourage that to take to heart. That is how the Lord sees you as a result of His faithfulness. He sees you as beloved, splendid, glorious by His grace, beloved. We are His palace. We are His Versailles because of His faithfulness. So this is the call then for our faithfulness, not that we're trying to earn His faithfulness. He's given it to us. But in light of it, we're called to be faithful. So we go back to verse, the end of verse 6, and we are His house. If indeed, indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we glory. I want to go back to verse 1. If you can pop back to verse 1 again. Therefore, us holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling, fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge as our apostle and high priest. Fix your thoughts on Jesus. We fix our thoughts on him because he has been faithful because of what he has given to us, because of what we have in him. He has built us. He has sustained us. He has decorated us. He has made us his own. And we infix our thoughts on him because he enables us to be faithful. We cannot do it on our own. It is only by his grace. He enables us. And so we fix our thoughts on him. How do you fix your thoughts on Jesus? How do we do that? You know faithfulness in worship, faithfulness in His Word, faithfulness in prayer, faithfulness in Jesus in our relationship with Him being the priority in our lives. Not that we're trying to earn anything from Him, but because that's who we are. That's who He's called us to be, faithful, fixing our thoughts on Him. How is He calling you to be faithful? Where in your life, my life, is he saying, you know, I want to call you to faithfulness. I want you to change this. I want you to do this. Where is he calling you to be faithful? Where is he calling me to be faithful? How does he want to work in your life? May he bless and be at work in each of us by his faithfulness to us to equip us to be faithful to him. Let's pray. We praise you, Lord, for your faithfulness. You have built us as your palace, as your house, by your death and resurrection. And you are faithful with us always, equipping us, strengthening us, blessing us. Send us your spirit, Lord, to enable us to be faithful to you as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen.